and welcome to the program. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for uh, joining us. This is Moneyline with Nancy, and I am Nancy Naji. Uh, today, we will be looking at the ease of doing business in Nigeria. My guest will be joining me shortly, uh, Dr. Jumoke Oduole, who is the special advisor to the president on the ease of doing a business. We will be taking a look at the Nigerian business environment. We do know that in Nigeria, to do, do business is tough. To do business comes with so much un uncertainties. You've got to be tough, and the tough has to get going in Nigeria. But what are the things that Pebec, We'll tell you more about that. What are the things that Pebec has been doing at least since the last five years or so to make the business environment better? Those are some of the things that I'll be interrogating today on the program. But we'll give you definitely updates on the market. So many things happening right now as a re result of this Russian-Ukraine crisis. Stock markets around the world are sinking. All prices are surging to the most in 13 years. Brent crude is around 126 US dollars a barrel. Some may say Nigeria should be smiling to the bank because of all price at 126 US dollars. But like I've said here on the show, at least last week or since this Russian uh, attack on Ukraine started, that we may not really smile to the bank because we'll have higher subsidy payments to make. But I'll be giving you details on that when we come to the morning market brief. But meanwhile, let's quickly take our business news. According to the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Emefele, Infrastructure Company Limited will begin negotiations on road infrastructure along the Lagos Free Trade Zone where Dangote Refineries and uh, Toleram Group Enterprises are located. Uh, during Governor Emefele's tour to Lagos Free Zone, he said the road construction will help to decongest the area uh, surrounding the Lagos Free trade access and the project will be carried out in partnership with the federal and state governments. According to him, the free zone ports would unclog Apapa and Tinkan ports purely from the fact that it would divert traffic away from Apapa. Bank borrowing from the Central Bank of Nigeria declined for the second month in a row in February, falling by 47% to 666 billion Naira owing to continue the improvement in the interbank system's uh, liquidity. Banks, on the other hand, boosted their idle money deposits with the CBN by 80% to 489.05 billion Naira in February. Bank borrowings from the Apex Bank fell 46% in January to 1.3 trillion Naira, while deposits rose by 29% to 272 billion Naira. Dr. Mohamed Abubakar, Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, has launched a program to generate 4.42 billion naira for 60,000 smallholder farmers in four states, as well as make Nigeria the world's leading tomato exporter. The four-year project, tagged hot in Nigeria, is in collaboration with uh, the Netherlands and would also seek to boost production in okra, what we know as okra. Uh, onion and pepper value chains. The project will be implemented, implemented in Kano, Kaduna, Ogun, and Oyo states and will be managed by Dutch institutions such as the International Fertilizer Development Center and its consortium partners, East West Seed Knowledge Transfer, Yengine University and Research, and Kit Royal Tropical Institute. The Bank of Industry has committed $10 million in a women-focused fund to help Nigerian firms run by women in an effort to encourage export enterprises managed by women. Olukai Odekbito, BOI's Managing Director and Chief Executive, said this while at the bank's International Women's Day event in Lagos. He further mentioned that the bank has partnered with the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board to award $20 million to women-led oil and gas enterprises. The African Development Bank's uh, flagship initiative, Technology for African Agricultural Transformation, has revealed ambitions to increase Africa's food output by 100 million tons per year through the uh, deployment and usage of smart agricultural technologies. 
According to the bank, the plan is anticipated to decrease food imports in half, adding that Africa now imports around 47 billion naira worth of food with aspirations of cutting imports by half with an extra 100 million tons of food. The International Monetary Fund says countries that have very close economic links with Ukraine and Russia are at particular risk of scarcity and supply disruptions. The Washington-based fund in a press statement titled IMF Staff Statement on the Economic Impact of War in Ukraine lamented that countries that have very close economic links with Ukraine and Russia are at a risk of scarcity and supply disruptions and are most affected by the increasing inflows of refugees. It added that poor households across the world would suffer from the increase in food and fuel prices as the Ukraine-Russian war persists. Finally, Nigerians have been assured that the current challenges of fuel scarcity will soon become the theme of the past. Dr. Billy Gili Harris, President Petroleum Products Retail Outlets Owners Association of Nigeria, will give the assurance while speaking on the current fuel scarcity situation in Nigeria. also advised Nigerians to be orderly while visiting fuel stations to make purchase of the commodity in order to ease gridlocks on highways. Take a listen. We are now seeing over all the media to say so 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 fuel station uh, retail outlet has been supplied 40,000 liters of product or 60,000 or 120,000 liters of product and advise the public to go orderly to buy. We can even find a method of make sure we prompt you know, the drivers on the road to come. So there will be no gridlock. Right now, this is happening because there is no clearly defined process on how to do it. And we are offering that we can do this to make sure that it works. Because we have different things that we can be able to introduce. It's a matter of thinking. We have, we're in a problem, so we must think out of the box and so solve them very sharply too. Let's quickly take a break, and when we return, I'll be taking you through the morning market brief. Like I said earlier, stocks around the world are tumbling while all prices are surging. I'll break down those details when we return from this break. To join us again.
All right, welcome back to the program. Let's quickly take you through the market. I must begin with the NGX. That is the Nigerian uh, stock market. Uh, the broad index was down last week. We saw a weekly close of about 13 uh, basis points for uh, the all share index. As you can see right here on the wall, 47,268 market capitalization at around 25 trillion naira. We saw the year to date return settling at around uh, 10 percent. All right, if we take a look at other markets that we track for you on the uh, program here, talking about uh, the money market system, liquidity was elevated for the most of uh, last uh, week as uh, it received a boost by the OMO repayment as well as FAC allocation uh, last uh, week. Uh, for uh, the OBB and overnight rates, we saw both rates uh, falling to about 13.33% and 13.83% respectively. Analysts expect that its bank rates would hover at current levels this week in the absence of uh, major uh, inflows. If we take a look at the local bond market, it ended uh, in uh, the bullish territory on liquidity uh, inflows. There was massive liquidity and that drove interest across most maturities. Uh, analysts also expect that the bullish bias will continue uh, to wane significantly given the absence of any uh, catalyst. What else do we have? The euro bond uh, market was bearish the whole of uh, last week. Of course, the escalating tensions in Eastern uh, Europe sustained a global risk of uh, sentiment. And that is actually also feeling sell-off uh, across uh, board, the Nigerian sovereign uh, curve. Uh, for the Naira, we saw it drop against the U.S. dollar to 416 Naira, a 61 Kobo at the I and E window. The I and E window means investors and exporters window. So when you hear me say I and E window, that's what it means. Investors and exporters FX window. So the Naira was down at uh, 416 to uh, the greenback. Foreign exchange reserves, according to the central bank, uh, this morning on uh, March 3, foreign exchange reserves to at uh, 39.87 billion naira. All right, what else do we have? Let's quickly check out global markets. Like I mentioned earlier, stocks are st tumbling today as oil prices are soaring to uh, their highest level in 13 years, raising fears about a further spike in inflation uh, that could damage the global economy. Here in Nigeria, inflation is still around 15%. Uh, percent. In the United States, inflation has grown uh, up to 7%. Other economies across the world are also suffering inflation. And with what we're seeing right now, with all prices up at 126 US dollars a barrel, especially for the consumers. Now, just before I came into the studio, I saw that a gallon of gas is uh, costing about four US dollars. So th the Americans, for example, uh, are reeling really uh, from it. In Asia, we saw the Hang Seng of Hong Kong sinking as much as 5% in morning uh, trade uh, today overnight. While we were asleep, those Asian uh, folks were uh, trading. So you can see it's all red across board. The Nikkei 225 of Japan also tumbled about 3% uh, percent after we saw all prices surging and all prices surged after the u.s secretary of state said that uh, the u.s is looking into a possibility of banning russian oil with its allies and we saw that um you know making oil prices i uh, saw so analysts are actually also saying this time around that elevated oil prices may threaten uh, the company's margins as well as consumer spending outlook all right, what else do we have? Let's quickly go over to other commodities and let me see. Gold, in fact, this was gotten at around 9.15 a.m. this morning. Gold has crossed the $2,000 mark an ounce. And that's its, its highest since August of 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, natural gas, as you can see here, about $5. Cocoa is trading around $2,582 U.S. dollars. Palm oil up about, uh, is that up or down? at 6,538, <laughs> that's for palm oil. So you can see what I say here on the program that we need to diversify our economy uh, because we do have palm oil 
And from palm oil, you can get a lot of things. Or crude palm oil, you can get a lot of things. So you can imagine that it's trading for over six thousand dollars, while Brent crude is going for about one twenty six, one twenty seven. And you know, Nigeria's Bonnie Light is benchmarked against that. Let's quickly take a break, and when we come back from the break, it will be time uh, for us to delve into our interview, the ease of doing business in Nigeria. How far? So far, you can also send your comments and questions uh, now that you're watching. Uh, Dr. Jumoke Oduwale, the special advisor to President Buhari, on the ease of doing business, will be joining me after the break. Don't forget to join us on all our social media platforms on Twitter, we're there, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and on YouTube, Moneyline with Nancy TV. We'll be right back. Hello, 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 and welcome to the program. This is Moneyline with me, Nancy. So we, we really have to keep thinking out of the box about how to get money to the least uh, accessible in our society. Everything has to be re-examined mm. in our economy, mm. in our health system. We are also ensuring that government does not continue to manage this refinery because government is not really equipped to manage refinery. We need to come forward and, and do something different so that we move from a situation of uh, looking at things from uh, uh, purely a consumptive uh, approach to a productive uh, environment. The government and the people need to really ha agree on the need for a departure from business as usual. We are now on the process of recovery. It is what I call a bumpy journey to an uncertain destination. This is Moneyline with me, Nancy Naji. Uh, it's so nice to know that you're joining us again at today. The government needs to put more energy, more resources, not only in terms of providing the financing that we have seen. Everybody finds favor in public domain to say we have, uh, we have done this, provided this capital, and this, our psyche has been made to measure uh, uh, the kind of impacts we need to create in the MSME ecosystem at, as only resting on the fact that we've doled out, we've financed this. Not, what makes the MSME work well is the ecosystem. What is the cost of energy? How safe is it to produce and sell? How access I mean, do you have to the market? What friendly fiscal policies are there? to allow MSMEs to operate and grow, such that the ultimate contribution to the economy will now create the necessary impact we need to grow the economy. Welcome back to the program. In case you're just joining us, Dr. Jumoke Oduwale, the special advisor to the president, is joining me right here at the table. She's also the Secretary of the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, what we call PEBEC. Dr. Duwale, good mm -hmm. to have you on the show and welcome again. It's been quite a while. Yes, it I has. think we spoke either before COVID. Before COVID. Before I don't think I've been here, yeah. No, it was after August was of 2020. Kama. During Kama. Yes, Kama. yes, yes. Yes, that was yes. The last time yes. So yeah. how are you doing? Well, I'm good. I'm good. Thank good. you. Always a pleasure to be here, Nancy. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Likewise. Good to have you. Thank now, you. let's talk about, just give me a general overview. You know, I know Pebec is five years now, yeah. um, you know, but just give me a general overview of the business environment, hmm. you know, now. Like I said in my intro, it's tough to do business in Nigeria. It is. Uncertainties and all of yes. that. What are the kind of feedbacks you get? you know, just objectively? Okay, thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. um, so PEPEC was formed in July 2016 because obviously it's, it's, an, it's, it's no gain saying that it's quite difficult and challenging doing business here. And why is it so difficult? Uncertainties, regulatory bottlenecks, um, legislative obstacles, and really a lack of coordination so it's not that no other administration had done things on business climate, but they were more um, in silos. So the council was uh, set up to bring that coordination, to bring that political will, and to bring a continuity and stability to institutionalize reforms. That is where you see traction. So what I hear from private sector all the time, especially 
when there's like a policy flip-flop or there's a new regulation that just comes out and there wasn't engagement. So people have their business plans, they have their projections, things are just mm -hmm. up in the air. And then when they can't get transparency, when they don't know what is required of them, or suddenly it changes, you go to one office, it's, it's suddenly, so those are the things that we systematically work on. We work on people issues, processes, and to some extent infrastructure, because the honorable ministers on the council also have those portfolio, power, transport, uh, works and housing, finance, of course, industry trade and investment. So it's a, it's a melting pot where we try to tackle on, on you know, decom decompress and then try to tackle them. But it, it's not easy at all. It's actually quite challenging to do that. How have you been working with the ministries? Because you just said ministers now. How have you been working with them? Because some also accused Febak at the time of <laughs> getting into other <laughs> people's portfolio. So how has the, you know, well, how has it been? Has it been well, working with your ministers or, it, or the it ministers hasn't been, rather? Been bad. So my <coughs> boss, uh, His Excellency the Vice President, is known for his collaborative skills. He chairs the PEBEC, he chairs mm -hmm. the NEC, and he's also extremely cerebral and yet practical. So he chairs the council, and there are about 13 ministers. There's the head of service, the secretary to the government, the central bank governor, and a representative from private sector, Mr. Dr. Suleiman. So it's, it's sometimes, you know, change is never easy. We relate more with the agency heads and with the line officers. So I have a very young team that are at the airports, at the seaports, they're at CAC, they're talking with stakeholders, and our stakeholders are actually MSMEs. So we're looking for systemic intervention. When I tell larger corporates that uh, they have access to mm -hmm. power, so our focus is really you don't have to know anybody to have. So those are the, the our primary audience that we listen to. We have our reportgov.ng app. So we also get a lot of feedback from that. And then we have our stakeholder engagements, like our national tour that I'm sure you'll mm. ask me about yeah. in a few minutes. <laughs> so we hear a lot of the pain points and the frustration. We also track social media closely. So we hear the tweets, we see the Instagram. People you know, tag me all the time, tag our business made easy handle all the time. So I believe we have our finger on the pulse on where the shoe is pinching. And so we try to communicate this to the public and civil servants that what affects them affects you. Because if, if Post Health, for instance, harasses an investor or takes $100 from them uh, or something, extortion, they have a nasty experience through our airports. Guess what? They go to Ghana and it's like Aquaba. Mm. And, and where's the investment going to be placed? It's targeted at the Nigerian market, but the jobs and the opportunities will go to a neighboring country. So we try to have that honest conversation and to make everybody aware. And it's both ways. Also to make private sector aware that the way they also treat public and civil servants sometimes is not very nice and respectful. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you said this because I've also had some experiences around airports yeah. and all of that. I kind of exp there was a time, I don't know, I've not traveled in a while, but at least early this year you're traveling, you're seeing people, even the immigration officers and co, oh, madam, they'll be greeting you on endlessly for you to get something. You know, like, and I've spoken to a few of them. You guys are public officers, please. You know, it's not that we can't give you, but, you know, you, you mirror the nation. So whatever happens there, people think that the rest of us are like that. But, but, but let's take a look at PEBEX initiative. And I want to take a look at it holistically, an assessment in the last five years. I know uh, PEBEX celebrated five years in December. Mm -hmm. You graciously invited me, so <laughs> I was there. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I heard what the vice president was saying and all of that. But speak to me holistically about it, at least in the last five years. So the last five years, is actually almost six years. It'll be six mm. years in July, but we started operations about October, really. It's been mixed. We've had some really high points. The World Bank is of doing business rankings, which is based on empirical uh, verification from private sector. Uh, we moved up 39 places. We were twice recognized as a top 10 reformer in, th in a three-year period. Those are things you can't buy in the market. It's hard work that delivers that. Now, people will say, rankings, why are you focused on rankings? We looked at both the perception 
and the actuality for exactly the reason you said about your airport experience. So globally, investors are looking at the rankings and Nigerian investors also. Now, our real testimonials are from the MSMEs, what they feel. Every reform is created or curated with a tunnel system. We have a brain dump, we listen to all the pain points, and then we start distilling. We look at global best practice, we look at best fit for Nigeria, and then we start this negotiation process with the ministries, departments, and agencies. So if you have 10 steps right now, do you really need the 10? We've always done it this way, madam. Yes, but can we look at, look at what other countries are doing? Does this make sense? And really, our colleagues are ready to listen. So we've had good traction with, with public and civil servants, especially the, the more the reform-minded their leadership is, the more mm -hmm. we've been able to get done. Mm, I like that. Yeah. That's the phrase. The yeah. more reform-minded, especially the head is. Yes, yes. Mm. yes. So the reforms will now trickle down yes. there. Can I have an idea of how many reforms that have been completed since when the 60-day action national action plan uh, has been created? Because I know you always have 60-day... Yes. 60-day... Uh, yeah. Accelerators, action plan. Yes. yes, yes. So yes. how many of those reforms have you been able to yeah. complete and just give me an example of, of okay. those. Okay, so over the, <coughs> the last five and a half years, inclusive of the NAPS, we've uh, over 160 reforms have been completed. So the National Action Plan, the 60-day accelerator, which we started in 2017, we had two that year, but we saw that there was some reform fatigue. So we stuck to having just one in Q1 of every year. So we're actually in the middle mm, of oh one yeah. right now, the seventh iteration. And what that, that is, is a system where we've negotiated. It's like ready, steady, go. We've had a discussion with our MDA colleagues. We've agreed on what we need to do. And we just set the target. OK, in the next 60 days, let's push, 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 push. So things like um, visa on arrival was, a, was, a one, of, was one, of the implemented, one of the reforms implemented. There's several things under automation and process reviews. They're not always things that you may notice immediately but so for instance you used to have to have some sticker at the back of your ticket when you mm. travel domestic mm. it's not there anymore or you don't have to have somebody checking and giving you uh, anymore because we, we asked the airport management we, with through fan we had them collaborate with the airlines and back end that so a lot of things have been back ended okay, so that's why i don't see that again yes yes and so that's a perfect people and, tax and, and that took over a year wow yeah just to take off that sticker. yeah because there was no trust Mm. between the airlines and the airport authorities. Mm. It's, a, it's like a, it's a levy. Mm. So the airlines, the airport authorities claim that the airlines wouldn't pay. And the airlines claim that buying this thing up front and then sticking it is just not. So we were like, how does that become the traveler's problem? You guys sort it out. There's automation, use technology. So finally, they were able to come to an, and it's been working well. So other practical things like that, that in in a in accumulation it just makes things easier but you, you don't necessarily but we have big ones like the camera mm. that took about three years and a whole host of collaboration from the corporate affairs commission to the ministry of justice to the nigerian bar association section on business law about 40 law firms worked on that uh, the national assemblies the senate's uh, business roundtable so you have a lot of collaboration needed to push things in the right direction. And when that happens, we really get the best for Nigeria. Mm. And that Kamala law was like first time in like 30 years, since yes. 1990? Yes, I that was a reenactment. Mm. There have been very little tweaks, but that was a full repeal and reenactment. Mm. And we got some good things in there. Mm. Like, yeah, we got quite a few good things in there. Since the last time you were here, because the last time you were here, we talked about Kamala too. Yeah. Have you gotten, because I remember you also told me, okay, this is a law now, the president has signed it. If, you also, if individuals or businesses think that they can add more, have you heard any kind of feedback oh to say, yes. okay, this one, we need to put oh new things yes. there? Oh, yes. You know, the one thing I've noticed about reforms, and this is across the board, I mean, Nigerians want more, and rightly so. So every time you have a good reform, you get a lot of engagement. How about this? And you get really good ideas. So you get pushback. This isn't really going to work. This wasn't properly thought through. Let's amend this. So we already have a whole... Well, not, not too many, but we have some good amendments that we want to make to the camera mm. through our omnibus bill that should be going to the National Assembly soon. Mm. Yes. Okay, so that's an announcement. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> so hopefully it's going to peck in another couple of weeks. Okay, so, so I asked the question. Yes. Fantastic. Um, you, you talked about the accelerator programs, the mm -hmm. national, is it national accelerator program action or national plan. action plan? Action plan, uh -huh. yes. There's a 7.0 now, yes. isn't it? What are the priority areas? So with that, we have an agro-export intervention, okay. um, specifically for agro-exporters that are having a, a lot of pain points in that area. Then we have an airport intervention, because you know, especially last quarter, we had a number of embarrassing uh, incidents with the airports. And then we have our usual, there's um, a draft legislation we'd like to complete on insolvency for the CAMA, operationalizing that, that structure. And we have automation for different agencies um, that we'd like to put in place. So those are the types of interventions. Of course, we have regulatory reforms that we want to put in place. So those are the buckets, about mm. five big buckets. So, so what, what is the difference between this NAP 7.0 and others? Is it just about the different sectors or it's about attacking those reforms in a different manner? It's about the determination to complete it within a time frame. So when you leave reforms open-ended, they can just go on and on, you can get excuses, you can get, so when we get the council to approve particular reform interventions be done, in a particular time frame, it puts pressure on everybody, it puts pressure <coughs> on us, it puts pressure on the agencies, the implementing agencies, and we announce it to the public. So it's also very transparent and people can track. The last two have not been good at all, but we had, I mean, the first one we finished at 70 something percent. We asked for uh, an extension and we finished at about 84 percent. Who rates, who rates that? We track it, we track it, yeah. We track it, so who gives yeah. you feedback to get the percentages? Oh, the, the private sector. The private sector. So we, we validate the reforms. So if, if, for instance, we've been working very closely with a group of agro-exporters. So if you say that your goods can't get through the ports and these are the processes, NXP, different issues, we then start checking and you know it's broken down. So what it is about the way we work is that we don't just announce, go do this. We're a transformation office and we work with the ministries, departments, and agencies to break down the steps of the reform. So every week you can essentially see what we do, do a traffic light system. Is it red? Is it amber? Is it ongoing? Or is it green? Has it been completed? And then is it within the time frame? So you can really see who's doing what. And if they have issues, if they have uh, escalations, then we help with taking that up to their head of agency or their line minister or His Excellency the Vice President. Okay, I'm interested in, in, in knowing more about the two things which you just talked about, which will be some of the priority areas in this National Action Plan 7.0, which is agro-export mm -hmm. uh, intervention and the airport intervention. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the agro-export. What should okay. Nigerians expect? As in okay. What kind of reforms? Okay, let me tell you. So we, we did a, a deep dive um, focus groups with agro-exporters then we worked with colleagues to look at the processes that were complained about based on what people uh, in that sector said were issues. So payments and verification was a big issue. The inspection process, the terminals and shipping operators, they had issues from that end. And then access and documentation. So those are the specific ones. And then it's all broken down within each. So for instance, if the, I mean, one of the ones that came up was the NXP uh, flow. And that has a number of, you should see the chart, it has a number of agencies involved. And it's, it's really the law. So there are some things that we have to take for legislative reform. Mm. But in the interim, how do we deconstruct and make it easier in operation? So how do we get uh, MDAs to work together to streamline things or to layer things on top of each other we, we noticed a number of things. Um, I've moved on from NXP mm -hmm. now, just in that whole agro-export process that didn't have timelines. So when processes don't have timelines, it can slide and it's an opportunity for corruption. So there has to be a timeline that is publicly announced and then the agency has to be responsible for delivering on that. Mm. How about the airport intervention? Is the airport intervention, well, we've been working with agencies the airport experience, we had done quite a bit and we had gone quite far before COVID. 
I think that whole break set us back quite a bit and trying to get back to that um, service quality. There are a number of agencies involved again, a uh, huge number of agencies. FAN is sort of the mm -hmm. coordinating agency, but um, there are some budgetary constraints, there are some infrastructure challenges. But I'm pleased to say that the Lagos Terminal, uh, I just learned that the Lagos Terminal, the new Lagos Terminal, should be open next week. Mm. So that's huge news. I'm stealing fans down there, <laughs> but I can't help it. <laughs> yes, I just pray. I mean, that would be huge. We've got so many issues about the Lagos Airport, so many complaints about the Lagos Airport, just the whole experience from, mm. the, from the restrooms to the process, to the heat, to the... No issues. You yeah. come in once you go, once you come down yeah. from a foreign mm. airliner, so yeah. you just enter the kind of heat yeah like what i know so it's I gonna know. be better now by god's grace uh, not by god's grace dr Chimokin. no no no. they're working on it they're working on it they've okay. announced that they're going to open a new term you mm -hmm. see that lagos terminal is over 40 years old so it's been patched we work with fan the the chillers are bad maybe they'll buy some standing ones it can't work it can't do it the amount of flights so the volume that the airport it's like our seaports also, the volume that they were created to cater for is long yeah. outgrown, yeah. like in, uh. the, in, the, in the thousands of percentiles. So what they do is sort of palliatives, the escalators are old, trying to make them work. The model probably can't be found anymore, so we need the new terminal. So we've been working on palliatives all the while, waiting for the new terminal. Once the new terminal is open, then they can do serious work on the old terminal mm. because we actually need all that space mm. yeah i had an experience over uh, the holiday i traveled through the enugu airport and you know that time is so uh, jam-packed everybody wants mm -hmm. to like go to lagos mm -hmm. or in fact and i saw the airport authorities struggling because mm. the chairs even at the airport couldn't even contain all of us yeah. they were struggling and i saw the airport authorities their boss they just sat down and was observing said please just take the video let us send it to abuja <laughs> so that they will know that this <laughs> these chairs are not enough for people yeah. especially when the airport is jam-packed yeah. so things like that yeah we've been working very closely with the fan md i must commend him just trying to to look at ways and the airport managers have been under a lot of pressure the one in, in abuja is really phenomenal very reform-minded uh, the one in lagos works so hard with all the pressures and also trying to manage all the other agencies mm -hmm. especially the agencies that are armed when they are not armed and you know they're turf wars there there's a lot going on so we need that coordination and then the collaboration because these are Nigerians, two Nigerians, and then it's our national image, so. Compliance with Executive Zero, Executive <laughs> Order Zero One. Yes, the first Executive mm -hmm. Order of this administration. We've been tracking it um, from inception. We released our first compliance report after a year in 2018, and we've released uh, four so far. Now, again, speaking to reform-mindedness of the heads of agencies, and discipline and consequence management and really hard work pays off. So there's some agencies that have decided that they want to be transparent and efficient. And they've done a lot in improving their access to information, their websites, their phones being picked up. Those are the kinds of things we check. Uh, their responsiveness, I told you we have the report gov. So those are all transparency, access to information. Is your service level agreement, is it published? All the prices, are they there? Are you adhering to the timelines that you set out for the public? And we track that. They have a, a monthly report that they send to us um, in collaboration with Servicom and also the Office of the Head of Service and the Office of the Secretary to the Government also get copies of that report. So that's what we use for the tracking. And we also do the mystery shopping and the spot checking. So with that, you can see the agencies, you can see the high flyers, you can see the most improved. You can see the ones that maybe their minister will just see some abysmal and say, I never filled an exam in my life. How come we're at zero? What's going on? And then you see that when you track things and you publish them, it matters when you record things empirically. It's not me or my team picking on anybody. This is what it is. So agencies that don't pay attention are usually quite embarrassed. But some of them, the embarrassment fades after the report has been published. 
and but we we release the report and then it's up to also their their users their customers to make reports to use reportgov.ng to document the complaints so that we can know because we can't really feel the pulse unless we get not just tweeting and then you vent it and it's gone or, or a, a WhatsApp broadcast and it's gone, but actually sending in a report or a letter even or calling feedback, it does help us to track. So if there's some agency in the in office, regional office, say in Atamawa, that's giving stakeholders trouble in the region, let's say for instance, it's a NAFDAQ office or something, we can pinpoint it if there's information coming and we see that, hey, wait a minute, we have 60% uh, of the complaints for this agency is coming from this office. Then we can go investigate what's going on in this regional office, who is the person in charge, what is the process. Sometimes even their bosses in Abuja may not know. Mm. So. so let's talk about subnational reforms. Okay. <coughs> and um, I know you, your office, you do what you call, I think, lituation series. Listen, yes. implement, please help me track. implement and track. Yes. Yeah. And tell me how you're able or to engage governors and those stakeholders and subnationals to make business easy in states. Because businesses yeah. happen really in the in state. The they are states. not only in Lagos and Abuja. Yes, in the states. Uh, no business really happens at federal level. Every business is anchored in, in, a, in a geographical location. So realizing that very quickly, we started partnering with the NEC. PEPEC started partnering with the NEC in 2017. And the governors unanimously agreed to this. So it's to a replication of the federal structure the state is of doing business council, a state reform champion, and you you have we had our first iteration of a subnational ease of doing business, our homegrown one, not World Bank or anything, mm. our homegrown one. And with that we were able to see what was happening in different regions. We also had a pilot cost of compliance a report. We used Lagos and FCT to know just there's there's a cost that is in taxation that businesses are facing because of regulatory compliance costs. And nobody was really tracking mm. that. So we tracked that and we gave that information to states as well. So what that has done is, is it's helped states to target and to benchmark and also there's a peer review. So we've had quite a bit of engagement. There are quite a few states that are quite um, focused at the ease of doing business intervention that the governors have put. Which states? Uh, I would well, like to know. Yeah, Just Kad give me Kaduna three is really or five. Focused. Kaduna is focused. Um, Enugu has been quite good. AKT, I'm going to get into trouble. Of course, Lagos and Kano, who we work very, very closely with. Um, I should stop. Gombe. Gombe has been really good. No, you engaged. shouldn't stop. Go ahead. I, I so the other states on. that <laughs> are down there would also buckle up. Uh, Anambra has been good. Um, Abia has been good. They, were, they really moved up. Um, who else? Sokoto, uh, the governor at one of the neck meetings. He, at that time, Sokoto was, the, was lagging behind in, in Northwest. They were the last state in Northwest. And he was like, no, this cannot be. And he just made it. He said, this is not going to stand. And you should see the number of reforms in the, in the next. In fact, he insisted I come to Sokoto. And I went immediately after COVID, September 2020. And I was really impressed that they had a team. They were structured. They were on their reforms, their tax payment system, a number of things. So. It takes political will and a structure. It's not something that you can wish into being. Mm. It takes progressive layering, you, you know, reforms, and you can never stop. If you stop, mm. it unravels mm. because it's behavioral change. And if you don't listen to private sector, you're off doing something else while their priority is something else. So it takes a lot of collaboration. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, so how about the top MDA performers? Ah. Since you've called state and you, you work, your office works with uh, MDAs, can you just okay, give me like five? In, in terms of report gov or in terms of... Being reform minded and in terms Oof. of, yes. You know one thing, it even changes when the head of agency changes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It even changes. There's some that the succession is really good. Um, but why is it like that? Just like what you said, behavior. Yes, it is. It's something and that yeah. should... And there's yeah. some that maybe the new agency head is settling down and just doesn't prioritize. And it takes like a year or two before they're like, oh, wait, this was helpful. 
So we have to keep engaging and speaking. My team has to keep trying to escalate. The reform champions can come under quite a bit of pressure from their colleagues. They're always sort of like internal affairs, like always um, on their colleagues on this reforms. What's this Pebec thing all over? But when we have like our Pebec Awards and they're up there with the vice president, then people see that the work actually hard work pays off. You've yeah. not given me, okay, give me one. You're not going to escape. <laughs> okay. Give me one MDA. Ah, this is, this is a tough one. You're putting me on the spot, Nancy. I would say that one of my most phenomenal reform champ, like reform-minded heads of agency was the immediate past Comptroller General of the Nigerian Immigration Service. Okay. Comptroller okay. General um, Babandide. Yeah, Babandide. he was really phenomenal. He was really phenomenal. That's now we started working with, yeah, that. yes, with Acting Comptroller General mm -hmm. Idris. We started, well, it's now been a few months. He's gone on a mystery shopping himself and all that. But we had a good run mm -hmm. with Comptroller General Babandide. Okay, yeah. even as, as we have about less than three, four minutes to the end of the show, there are so many things to ask you. <laughs> but l let me ask you this, which, which of your focus area uh, is most challenging? Because a lot of people say, okay, Nigeria, the ports. You've said it. Okay. So I, I read ports, your mind. For me, it is, really. Both the seaports and the airports. And the reason is simple, and we've touched on some of them already. It's people issues. It's process issues. It's infrastructure issues. And then it's a lot of agencies involved. So you have at <coughs> least sort of seven core agencies in each of them at the seaports. You have customs, NPA, shippers councils, and you have the terminal operators, you have the, the concession, yeah, it's just the shipping lines themselves, you have the freight forwarders, a lot of stakeholders. And just piecing everything together, making sure that the process works, you need technology to remove the corruption, only technology would do it. So trying to get a single window in place has been so tough for Nigeria. Other countries have done it. In fact, we're one of the laggards on the West African coast. So um, that has been a very tough, mm. tough one. Um, the, the airports also, the infrastructure just is beyond what we are. Okay. We should be a hub. And so with the new airports we have, the Abuja airport, the Port Harcourt airport, it's not like nothing is happening. Even with the seaports, we've mm. had quite traction, reduce the documentation. We have efforts, but we need a lot more collaboration, technological integration, decompressing of, legis um, of processes which need some legislative amendments. Okay, okay, Dr. Oduwale, you are also moving your reforms to local governments with AMAC yeah, as yeah, pilots. Yeah, Can you speak to me about that in like 30 seconds? AMAC. The next 30 seconds, Compliance, I know there's a <laughs> compliance of 72 hour timeline for complaint okay. resolution. If okay. you have any issue with any agency, three okay. days, 72 hours. Okay. So what that has is that? That is what FEC gave us. It's been tough. It's been tough. Some agencies would do it. They have a team, they're disciplined, they work hard, they work with my team. Some agencies <coughs> would leave it hanging for weeks and we're chasing them. So consequence management is a big problem for us. Now for AMAC, we had so many complaints that we've used them as the pilot for engaging with local government level. Here we are in Abuja, and the minister of FCT wants Abuja to be sort of an ease of doing business hub. We went on radio, and all we could hear about was the task force, the traffic, mm. the road. The whole program was taken over by that, so we put them on report gov as well. And in fact, my team is meeting with them today. A lot of issues with AMAC in particular, here in Abuja, the TV license, the radio license, the laptop license, the taking everybody to court, clogging up the, the judicial system. We've been trying to engage, but Nigeria, we are a federation. So it's been really tough for the federal government to engage with AMAC and to, we can't insist that the council chairman participates or relates. It has some persuasion. Yes. So, so Nigerians really need to remember that when mm -hmm. voting and when mm -hmm. holding people accountable That's that right. these things matter because mm -hmm. even the, the minister of FCT cannot insist. Yeah, it's not even like states, you hear states battling all the time, like the money to local governments. Maybe states have some, um, it's not even like that here. So that whole discourse, mm -hmm. yes, to whom much is given, much, much is, is expected. expected. Yeah. So I think Dr. Dudu will leave it at that for now, <laughs> for today. We'll continue yeah. to track and see what happens. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure.
All right, I've been speaking with Dr. Jumakel Duwale, who is the special advisor to President Buhari on the ease of doing business. She's also the secretary of PEBEC, that's PEBEC's office. I, al I also should say there's a World Bank uh, ranking on ease of doing business, but that has been stopped. And it was stopped, I think, some last, year, last yes, last year formally. But the World Bank is saying that they will bring back what they call the business enabling environment B. I saw that some some weeks ago. So we hope to see when it is launched. Thank you all for being on the show today. Be the best you can be and be that change that you want to see. I am Nancy Naji. Please join us again tomorrow for another edition, another guest, another topic. I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye now. <laughs>